On this week's edition of New York Now, coverage of the State Democratic Convention in New York, a conversation with State Democratic Chair Jay Jacobs, an update on good cause eviction, news on the debate over farm workers, and more. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass legislation. I will fight like hell for you every single day, like I've always done and always will. get another stand. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. Governor Kathy Hochul is officially her party's designated nominee for governor. Democrats met in New York City this week to vote on the nomination. And while it was an easy win for Hochul, she's still got a long road ahead. First, she'll have to win a primary in June if any of her challengers can get on the ballot. And then she'll move on to the general which Republicans think they have a chance at winning for the first time in two decades. But Hochul told Democrats at the convention this week that she's not worried about the competition. I've done this a few times, my friends. Here's my playbook. You run with confidence, but with the tenacity of an underdog. You take nothing for granted, and you fight until the very last second. And we have asked Hochul's campaign to have her on the show, but so far, she has not agreed to an interview. Well, let's get a closer look at the convention from this week now with Daryl Camp, who was there in Manhattan. Yes, so while Hochul is now the party's designated nominee, her two main primary challengers are not going anywhere. Congressman Tom Swazi chose former New York City Council member Diana Reyna as his running mate just before the convention started. He'll now need 15,000 petition signatures to appear on the ballot for the June primary after he withdrew his name from Thursday's nomination vote. Swazi says former U.S. Senator and First Lady Hillary Clinton called him and tried to talk him out of running for governor. However, he does intend to stay in the race and said giving New Yorkers more options is what democracy is all about. Democracy doesn't work unless there's competition. You have to be debating. I've got a better idea than you do. I can do it better than you can do it. I can do it cheaper. I can do it faster. I can help more people. The more competition there is, the more the politicians are forced to listen to the people. When there's no competition, for example, when all the seats are gerrymandered and everybody's in a safe seat and everybody gets reelected no matter what, then there's no competition and there's no good ideas that come from it. New York City public advocate Jamani Williams is also preparing to petition after receiving a little over 12 percent of the vote. Williams said in his past campaigns, petition time has been a time when the campaign starts to turn a corner. We are at the same time beginning to get momentum on our campaign. Our infrastructure is coming together. We're getting a, a lot of in, uh, endorsements at the right time. We have more support in uh, parts of upstate New York than we did at the end of 2018 when we got 47 percent of the vote. So we're really excited at this moment in time. While the primary race for governor will continue among Democrats, there were also some messages calling for unity among members of the party. One of those messages came from downstate Congressman Hakeem Jeffries, who some say is in line to be the next Speaker of the House. He said fighting against the Republican agenda should be the party's top priority. We fight for the people, they fight for the privileged few. We believe in the public interest, they're all about the special interest. We fight for the least, the lost, and the left behind. They fight for the wealthy, the well-off, and the well-connected. We believe in Social Security and Medicare. They want to take that away. We believe that health care is a right. They believe that it's a privilege. There was also a sense that the party is trying to move on from former Governor Andrew Cuomo. Attorney General Letitia James, who also had a short-lived run for governor back in the fall, received unanimous support for re-election to her current office at the convention. And her message seemed to indicate that New York is trying to move forward from the decade-plus Cuomo era. James directly addressed the sexual misconduct allegations against the former governor, saying that accountability should be the new normal. And to achieve that, he is now claiming the mantle of victim and disgracefully attacking anyone in his path, pushing others down in order to prop himself up. But I will not bow. I will not break. But the most high-profile appearance at Thursday's convention was from the aforementioned Hillary Clinton, who gave the keynote. While she's been a divisive figure herself in the party, she echoed the call from Congressman Jeffries that Democrats should work to unite ahead of this year's elections. That's why New York must be not just the home of the Statue of Liberty. We must be the defenders of liberty. 
not just a laboratory of democracy, but a protector of democracy. And we must reject the big lie about the 2020 election and the cover-up of the insurrection of last January 6th. So no major surprises from the Democratic convention, but in about two weeks, the Republicans will have their turn when the GOP convention takes place in Nassau County. And we will be there to see it all happen down in Nassau. Thank you, Daryl. So speaking of party unity, over the past few years, we have seen divisions open up in the state's Democratic Party between those on the far left and those closer to the middle. And in some cases, that's moved the entire party further left. Think of issues like legal cannabis and criminal justice. But that hasn't always worked to their advantage. Republicans in New York won some key races last year campaigning on proposals from the far left, even if their opponents were more moderate. But Democrats say this year won't be the same. For more on that, I turn this week to the chair of the state Democratic Party, Jay Jacobs. Jay, thank you so much for coming back. I appreciate it. Oh, thanks for having me. Of course, anytime. So let's talk about this year's elections. I think it's fair to say that last year, Democrats didn't get the results they were hoping for in some key elections, especially down on Long Island where you are right now. I'm wondering, as you look into this year as the party's chair, what's your strategy this year to not have that same trend in this year's elections? What do you wanna do differently to get more Democrats in that winner's circle over those Republicans? Well, you have to remember a large part of our problem in the last election and, and what happens in many elections, particularly the odd year elections, which are low tur turnout elections to begin with, is you're a, uh, you're a bit at the mercy of the political environment at the time. So we came into that election with 71% uh, uh, of the American public saying that the country was going in the wrong direction. Uh, our president's poll numbers were down, inflation was up, gas prices and the like. And of course, COVID was on the rebound and people were really unhappy. And then you had the underlying unhappiness over mandates. So I think the political environment for starters is gonna be better, but it's still gonna be a tough campaign as they all are. And we're gonna do everything we can to get our message out and combat the Republicans' message. You know, when you look at messaging, Republicans have really driven hard over the past few years, this debate over crime. We've seen a rise in crime nationally, obviously, which has happened here in New York as well. They've really pinned all this on bail reform, which is being discussed at the state capitol right now. I'm wondering from the perspective of a Democrat as the, as the party's chair, so Democrats in the state legislature are saying that they're probably not going to amend bail reform. So how do you get voters back on your side in this debate over crime? How do you convince them that Democrats as well can really nail down on this crime issue here in New York? Well, first thing is we have to be straight with the public. Um, crime is a real problem and we take it seriously and Mayor Adams is taking it very seriously. And there are things that we can do to beef up um, appropriate policing and, and uh, get involved in our communities to, to reduce crime. But using the false narrative that crime in New York is up because of bail reform has been something the Republicans have relied on because their, their strategy is all about either scaring the voters or making them angry. This is a national problem. Now, does that mean there aren't things that we can do uh, to fine tune that bail reform law? Of course, and, and I think that the Democrats will be looking at that. I don't write that off, but I think for the most part, you have to understand the good that bail reform has done. And, and let's go back to the start of this whole thing. What's your objective? What do you really want to do? We all want safer streets. We want crime to come down. Then the answer is to be, not that Democrats are, are, are soft on crime, but we have to be smart on crime. And some of the things we did in bail reform are smart. And they're gonna help make sure that people don't uh, get into a, a life of crime, which you know gets them into that revolving door of incarceration, back out on the street and back into jail again. So we wanna try to avoid that if we can, improve society, and yet at the same time be tough on violence and guns and all of the things that threaten uh, real people across our city and state. You know, in the party, there is a divide on this issue where some people don't want to change bail reform at all. Others are really strongly in favor of some sort of change, some sort of tweak. We don't really know what that would be yet. How do you reconcile that in, in these two factions of your party heading into this year's elections? If nothing happens with bail reform, I don't know if that's such an important conversation to have, but how do you reconcile those two factions that are so, so they're just on different sides of this issue, it seems? Well, you know, I think we have to have open conversations. I, and, and I've been doing that. I've been talking to legislative leaders 
uh, folks on the governor's team, and, and of course, uh, law enforcement. I met with uh, the president of the Nassau County PBA um, last week just to get their perspective. I, I want to hear from as many people as possible to get a good sense of really what are the solutions? What's the smart thing to do? Where are the real problems and, and where do we need to take action? But I think by listening to, uh, to each other and respecting each other, uh, we can make progress. A big part of the divide uh, is, is around the, the issue of race, frankly, because you know we take this term dangerousness and uh, wanting to give judges the discretion uh, to um, require bail, even if the crime doesn't uh, require it, just because the, the uh, alleged defendant has a certain, meets a certain dangerousness standard. Well, the problem is for many people, that term dangerous, you know, uh, dangerousness uh, might mean more blacks. Uh, and not whites, and it become, becomes a racial question. And we don't want to see that, and that's certainly not what anybody means. So I think that by uh, carefully looking at these issues and defining clearly what kind of discretion we're looking to allow judges to take in extraordinary circumstances where otherwise they might not need bail, uh, I think you know we can have a conversation around that and we can do so respectfully. You know, in a broader sense, there's also a split in your party between uh, this far left side of the Democratic Party, some of them are aligned with the Democratic Socialists of America, and then you have the other side of the party, which is a little bit more in the middle, more of your uh, moderate Democrat, your establishment Democrat, for lack of a better term. How do you bring those two sides together in this year's elections? We've seen um, the Working Families Party, which is considered far left, endorse Jumani Williams in the, the primary for governor. Governor Hochul won't be getting that. I'm assuming she's going to have the Democratic nomination nation, but how do you put those two sides of the party together going into the general so you can unite against the other party, the other major party, I should say? Well, the first thing I, I would say to you is um, I know that, you know, you have a lot of Republicans out there and even some independents who are um, allowing the Republicans to paint all Democrats as socialists. They paint Biden as a socialist. You're not going to find somebody more moderate than Joe Biden, but okay. So, you know, you know, use your broad paintbrush and do what you want. We have to explain to the public who we are. But as for getting along with those on our far left, I think it comes down to looking at what we all want to achieve. Not about power, not about personal uh, benefit, but what are you looking to achieve? And I think that the folks on the far left, and I disagree with uh, much of their platform as to what or how they want to do it, but their, their heart is in the right place. I respect their passion. I respect their approach. And, and I think they help push the moderates in the Democratic Party more um, uh, to more action than we might otherwise do. And I think that's a good thing. So I think the messaging is, look, your ideas are, are, are worthy of discussion. You're a part uh, of our bigger tent. But, you know, if this is a country that still believes in democracy, then the majority rules. And in the Democratic Party, the overwhelming majority of Democrats still are moderates. So yes, let's have those conversations, but we're not going to let one end of the party that's really much smaller uh, dictate to the rest. And I'm not going to allow Republicans to paint this party as a party of socialists or a party of the far left when we are the party of progress that has done so much good in, in, in face of the Republican Party, which frankly, think about it, does nothing. You have proposed nothing. And I think it's time you get out there and tell the people what you want to do with all this power you are fighting so hard to accumulate. All right, well, that's something that we will be watching over the next couple of months, head to the primary and then on to the general. State Democratic Chair Jay Jacobs, thank you so much as always. Thanks for having me. And State Republican Chair Nick Langworthy will join us in a few weeks when his party's convention is held on Long Island. But turning back now to the state capitol, we've told you that housing is expected to be a big issue this year in Albany. And part of that conversation is around something called good cause eviction. It's a bill that would basically set stricter standards for when a landlord could evict a tenant. And it's facing an uphill battle in Albany. Take a look. When New York's pandemic pause on evictions expired in January, a new push began for a statewide good cause eviction standard. And a bill at the state capitol to do just that started to gain steam. It would bar landlords from evicting their tenants without a so-called good cause, as defined in the bill. Judith Goldner is from the Legal Aid Society in New York City. And what good cause would do is say, it's fine for a landlord to ask you to leave, to leave but they're going to have to have a good reason for asking you to leave. 
And the good reasons are the kind of reasons that we think good landlords are the ones would want to have as the reasons to evict a tenant. The bill would still allow an eviction if the tenant doesn't pay their rent, violates the terms of their lease, intentionally creates a nuisance for others, uses the apartment illegally, prevents repairs by the property owner, and in some situations, if the landlord needs to move into the unit. Landlords would also have to offer tenants a renewal lease, which supporters say is crucial right now with the end of the eviction moratorium. It's sponsored in the Senate by Senator Julia Salazar, a Democrat from Brooklyn. But there are so many people whose leases may have expired during the pandemic or are expiring, who um, are either facing just a holdover eviction or they are facing astronomical rent increases. But in the weeks since the eviction moratorium ended, momentum for the bill has hit a standstill. A majority of Democrats in both the state Senate and the Assembly don't support it, but many haven't said why. And Salazar says that could change as evictions head to court in the coming weeks. It's always a process. It takes little time. It's been less than a month since the moratorium expired. But I think um, as we see that actually happening, people will really see for themselves and understand the urgency. In the state assembly, it's sponsored by Syracuse Democrat Pam Hunter. And she says that misinformation about what the bill would actually do has had a big impact on its progress. I think that the kind of rhetoric conversation about people who that don't understand what the legislation does always equates it to people who don't pay uh, their rent now have this protection with good cause. And that's absolutely not what this bill does. Both Hunter and Salazar plan to continue conversations on the bill to clear up any confusion and see if they can gain support. They say they're open to changes if the core of the legislation can be preserved. No legislation has ever been passed without some changes. And I'm willing and open to have conversations about that, but we need to be having those conversations. Opponents of the bill, meanwhile, want lawmakers to scrap a paragraph on rent increases. The bill would allow landlords to evict a tenant if they don't pay their rent. But there is a caveat. If the landlord raises the rent more than 3%, or one and a half times the rate of inflation, whichever is larger, a tenant could avoid eviction. But critics say that won't work for everyone and could backfire down the road. Jay Martin is the head of CHIP, a group that represents property owners in New York City. You're telling a a future builder of housing, well, if you build this housing, you may not be able to recoup the cost on that. So they're automatically going to consider not building here in New York State. And that's gonna lead to less housing. That's gonna exacerbate the problem that we already have. He's calling instead for the state to put more money into public assistance programs for tenants who can't afford to pay their rent. And that is something that supporters of good cause agree with. Governor Kathy Hochul has proposed a $2 billion pandemic recovery fund in her state budget, but it's unclear how that money would be divvied up. If lawmakers go along with it, that'll be decided in this year's state budget. The final spending plan is due at the end of March. And the majority leader of the state Senate said this week that the good cause bill probably won't pass in its current form. So we'll see what changes when the bill is amended. In the meantime, let's turn now to this week's panel. Josh Solomon is from Times Union. Thank you so much for being here, Josh. Thanks for having me. So it was a weird week. There was a lot going on. It started with the New York City mayor coming to Albany to talk about criminal justice for the most part and his funding opportunities. It ended with the Democratic State Convention, which was like a whole thing. We won't talk about it because we covered it on the front end of the show. Let's talk about bail reform. So the New York City mayor came up to talk about criminal justice and public safety. He wants dangerousness added to bail reform, which we've talked about so many times on the show. I won't go through it again. Go back and watch a different episode. Um, so where are the legislative leaders on that, Josh? It seems like they're not budging, but I talked, I spoke to Jay Jacobs on the show this week just a few minutes ago. He said that he's hoping the leaders do do something about it. So where are they? The Democratic leaders are not budging. Uh, they, they've stayed to their stance. They don't want to give up an inch on it, but also they believe, they say they believe in what it's done. Uh, they don't want to add a dangerous dangerousness standard. Uh, Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins this week said that she has no intention to touch the dangerousness element to it. It, it's, it would add in a racial element that she was looking to avoid when ch- making these changes to the law. So there's an apprehension from actually really doing anything with it, especially ahead of the election. And I think, uh, well, on last week's show, 
I, I had mentioned that I think the New York City mayor needed to come to Albany with a specific proposal of, um, when we talk about dangerousness, there's another term for it that's called risk assessment tools used in other states. And that basically creates a rubric for judges to go down and say, um, does this person have a permanent address? And people say, well, that's not fair because what if a homeless person is arrested? So that doesn't really make them dangerous. So I think that he needed to come up with a proposal. He didn't have anything specific. That being said, do we see any changes on criminal justice uh, in terms of, it doesn't have to be bail reform, it could be discovery. Does it seem like they're gonna do anything criminal justice related this year in terms of amending what they've already done? Uh, so far, it doesn't seem like they have that interest, but Governor Hochul has also kept her cards close to the chest in terms of what she wants to see on this. And you know, I think that's the biggest wild card at the moment. What will she do? How will she use her bully pulpit to move this conversation forward if, if there is a desire to, to kind of placate to some of the concerns? Uh, and, and nonetheless, there are concerns about, as you guys have covered, about uh, crime in the state. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is an issue that's not going away. I, I won't dwell on it because we had a feature last week or the week before on bail reform, and we could talk about that for a whole hour on the show. <laughs> so let's go to farm workers now. This is something that we covered in the fall, the, the future of farms in New York. There's a question right now about whether New York should lower the overtime threshold for farm workers from 60 hours down to 40 hours, like uh, basically every other industry in the state. The governor said this week that she hadn't made a decision on that just yet. So Josh, as you're looking at how this decision is formed, let's go over first, you watched every public hearing about this in uh, January, uh, I forget how many there were, three or four on them? Three or four. Yeah, three or four. <laughs> uh, what was the overwhelming sense there? It seemed to me like the overwhelming sense was farmers saying, don't do this. But then the wage board came out and said, yes, please do this. Right. And the, there, were, there were hearings to decide uh, to get public input on whether or not to lower that threshold to 40 hours. Basically, unions and labor rights groups wanted it to bring it down. The Farm Bureau, the agricultural industry wanted to keep it where it's at. It also split somewhat along party lines. And there was a swing vote on the three member wage board that was created to make this decision, mm -hmm. this recommendation. And they ultimately heard that input, decided that they wanted to lower it incrementally. But the incremental part seemed to be their concession to all the farmers. The overwhelming majority of the public comment was, don't lower it. This is going to crush our industry. This is going to crush particularly our smaller businesses. and. They were, they're worried about what's going to happen. It, it's the same refrain, though, that we've heard for about a century about worry that the industry is going to collapse. And typically, when there's that worry that the industry is going to collapse, on the other end of it is a government subsidy. Right. And that's what Governor Hochul has proposed in her budget, a subsidy to make farmers whole on the back end in a, in a refundable tax credit. So knowing that the recommendation is to phase in over 10 years, uh, farms say that that is still too much to cope with, right? Right, uh, the, the Farm Bureau is pretty much holding its line saying, this is not going to work. Governor Hochul, don't accept this. Uh, Commissioner Reardon, don't accept this recommendation. Do something else. Are they going to? I mean, it, it looks like we're gonna get a decision around spring. The Department of Labor has about 45 days from when the uh, wage board delivers its decision. And my understanding is they may have not delivered it yet, even though they Which already is, voted. Which is why, <laughs> I don't get it. So. I, I wonder if they're waiting to deliver it so they can time it so that um, the, the, it comes after, the decision comes after the state budget is passed. So then they have the subsidy in place and they can say, oh, well, we're, we're gonna do this, but here's the relief for the farmers. I, that's exactly what I think. The, the Farm Bureau has been pretty clear that they said that let's not account for this subsidy because we don't know if it's gonna end up in the budget. Let's not make decisions based off of something we don't know. And furthermore, this is a 10 year uh, rollout. The subsidy would really be effective at the back end of it. We don't know who's gonna be the governor. We don't know what the legislature will look like. Let's, let's not work this into the equation. Nonetheless, the governor is trying to use it as 
as a, a concession for them. That's a good point because in this year's budget proposal from the governor, she it's $130 million in overtime tax credits is I think the number, but, somewhere around there. <clears throat> and I'm wondering in future years, because right now if that passes, the overtime threshold is at 60 hours, right? It goes down to 40 hours. How much more than 130 do we need to get to to make those farmers whole? So I think it's 130 at the back end that they're ah, estimating, right? Okay. So then the it'll only be like somewhere between 20 and 40 mil in the first year. And basically, to explain that the tax credit basically covers what you wouldn't have to pay right now. So if you pay an overtime worker like 55, um, everything over 60 hours, and now the overtime threshold is 55 hours, the time and a half addition that you're paying in those extra five hours is where the, the government's saying, we'll, we'll bail you out for that, which it's is... It's yeah. complicated, and we'll, we'll see what it looks like in its final form. The devil's always in the details. Josh Solomon, we'll leave it there from the Times Union. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we will see you here next week. Until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. As always, have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.